Hello, we are with our guest, Professor Jack Katz, today. Before I begin my questions, I would like to thank him for acceptation and invitation. It's an honor to make an interview with you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. My first question is, how did you meet Odeoloji? <clears throat> um, you know that when you're 300 years old, as I am 300 years old, um, uh, memory is poor, so I have to work for my notes. <clears throat> I have a long story to tell you, but I think a very interesting one. As a child, I had a history of early recurrent otitis media, fluid in the middle ear, lots of it. And I, and I did poorly in school, very poorly. In fact, oh, I, I had poor speech, poor language, poor reading, and poor spelling, among other things. Now I understand that my problems had to do with auditory processing disorders. I was not able to process auditorily because of those middle ear problems that caused the brain to get misinformation. Um, I performed so poorly that I was left back in school. I don't know if you know what that means, left back in school. And um, unfortunately, in those days, uh, there was no speech, hearing, reading, or any of those kinds of help for children in school. So I, I just was miserable. Uh, one day, I learned, by the way, I'm getting to your question, but it's, it's a long route. <clears throat> um, one day, I heard that there was such a thing as mental retardation, mental retardation. Mental retardation means very low IQ. Well, I was so relieved to hear that there was such a thing as mental retardation because I finally understood why I was not able to learn in school when other children were able to learn. I just wasn't smart enough. So uh, so I was, because I, I didn't know why everybody else was learning and I wasn't. And it was because I wasn't smart enough. Um, <clears throat> uh, when I went to high school, uh, uh, things weren't much better. I had quite a bit of difficulty in high school, uh, but I had a wonderful English teacher in my last semester of high school. And she said that she previously had been a guidance counselor. You're familiar with guidance counselor? Somebody um, helps children with their problems in school and uh, she asked us to write a composition about ourselves. And from what we wrote, she might have a suggestion to us for what field we might go into when we go to college. Well, maybe I should stop right there for a moment. Uh, I was not planning to go to college. Uh, when I turned 15, I was doing so poorly in high school that I was going to quit school. But you're not allowed to quit until you're 16 years old. But I told my parents, when I turn 16, I'm going to leave college and get a job. Um, my parents were very, very upset by that. 
And one day my father called me and said, Mr. Cohen is here to speak with you. Mr. Cohen, my father was a house painter and Mr. Cohen worked with him. I said, Mr. Cohen is here to speak to me? Couldn't understand that. Uh, I said, why is here? Why does he want to talk to me? He said, I don't know. My father said, I don't know. Talk to him. So I saw Mr. Cohen and he said, I understand that you want to quit school. I said, yes, I'm, I'm doing so poorly in school. I'm not getting anywhere. There's no sense to me to stay in school. When I turn 16, I'm going to quit. Mr. Cohen said, you have to finish high school. You cannot quit. I said, but I, and I told him my story again. And he said the same thing to me. You have to. It's so important. You have to continue until you finish high school. We argued back and forth for an hour. After the hour, I said, okay, I won't quit. I knew he wouldn't stop, stop nagging me until I promised him I couldn't quit school. I can only imagine what my life would be like and what my history would be like if this kid who couldn't read, couldn't spell, poor speech, poor language, went out into the world. So uh, Mr. Cohen was a blessing to me that he didn't convince me, but I agreed that I wouldn't quit school. Um, uh, unfortunately, two months later, uh, Mr. Cohen suddenly died. And I always think back, thank goodness that he was alive to convince me. So, so that's the first little hurdle in getting to audiology. So uh, there's still about six hours more of talking before, no, before I get to the audiology. So my English teacher wanted us to write this composition. And, um, uh, and so I wrote this composition about being lazy because I, I wasn't getting any, there was no sense in doing homework because I, I, I did so poorly in school. And so I wrote things about myself. And when I got my composition back, she wrote two words on the top sheet of the paper. But I was so poor in reading, I had no idea what the words were. So I took them home and asked my brother, who was a good reader. And I said, what does this say? He said, speech therapy. I said, what is speech therapy? He said, I don't know. Uh, but eventually we found out what speech therapy was. And I thought, you know, that sounds good. I don't know if I could ever get to college because my grades were so poor, but I think I would like to do that. Um, so um, I applied to a, a college and, um, and in order to get into the college, they looked at your grades and they were awful and you you'd had to take a test. And so I took the test. I don't know how I did. And eventually I learned that I was, I made the cutoff score and I was accepted into the college. I made it by a quarter of a point. I only had a quarter of a point. Now I should mention that in that school, they lowered the score, the entrance score for boys compared to girls, because there were so many girls in the school, too few boys, they wanted to get more boys in school, so they lowered the entrance score. So, so I was so fortunate because I only made it by a quarter of a point. I never would have made it otherwise. There are so many things in my history that, that got me to audiology, and you'll see that it eventually will get there. But 
there was no chance of audiology uh, so far. So I um, so I got into college and I didn't do too well, but I did well in my speech and hearing classes. Um, uh, so four years later, I applied for a PhD. I mean, I'm sorry, for, for a master's degree. And I was accepted by two schools on condition. On condition means that they wouldn't accept me until I showed that I was able to do it. And so I had to take two courses and I had to do well in them. I did very well in the courses. And so I was accepted. Um, and then I finally graduated with a master's degree. Um, uh, a year or so later, I applied for a PhD and um, uh, when I was accepted, um, they wanted to know what my major was going to be. And I had a choice of speech or hearing. And I said speech because so much of my background was in speech. Very little of it was in hearing. Um, so uh, everything went well. I was a I was a good student, very good student, and uh, in both speech and hearing. Uh, after about a year and a half, um, I decided to start working on my dissertation. And um, my major professor said, what do you want to study? I said, I want to study phonemic synthesis. And then I told him what phonemic synthesis was. It was a test and therapy um, that I had used with children with articulation problems. And I found these amazing results. And I was able to turn it around and make it into a therapy. And those children improved so much. I was so excited by that. The response to me was quick and clear. The professors of speech laughed at me. They thought it was stupid and ridiculous to think that this thing could help anybody. And they wouldn't let me do my dissertation in phonemic synthesis. I was very, very hurt and disgusted and thought I would leave the PhD program, go to someplace else. But then I remembered I had this wonderful professor and he was an, an audiology professor. And so I switched to audiology. So this whole thing that I was, it, it turned in a, in, a, in a minute, it turned into audiology. I was not... <laughs> nothing about audiology. And uh, as it turned out, um, uh, audiology has been a joy of my life. So that one little minute when I thought of going into audiology uh, made all that difference. And all those other things, <laughs> if, if those things didn't happen, this could not have happened. That's the answer to my first question, to, to your first question. Um, I'm ready for your second one, and you'll see it's very brief. Thank you. So my second question is, in your opinion, is only audiology education sufficient to succeed in the field of audiology? If not enough, in which areas should we support ourselves? Um, uh, depending on what you're gonna do as an audiologist, different courses and different experiences um, will apply to different aspects of what you're gonna do. Um, but in life, just as in audiology, your breadth of knowledge, the wideness of your uh, knowledge and experience are invaluable. The more breath and the more experience you have with them, the better off you're going to be. Um, 
I, I think that one of the other things that is valuable is that uh, the desire and the ability to solve problems. Learning a particular subject is one thing, but to try to apply it and to use what you can to figure out how to help people, for example, uh, that's invaluable. Academically, speech courses were definitely uh, very important to me um, in audiology and in particular phonetics. Uh, in working with patients, uh, every day, or students, uh, every day I work with patients, I use phonetics. And I encourage students in audiology to make sure to get uh, a course in phonetics. Um, psychology is the other one that I have listed. And st statistics was critical. Uh, in my research and in my thinking. And so those would be the two things that I would encourage students to go into. Next question, please. Thank you. Uh, what what would you advise to audiology students about their careers? What path should they follow in career planning? Um, so audiology is a pretty broad field and um, and our, our professionals have to fill all those slots, but no individual can do everything. So um, one thing that, that I encourage students to do, you take the courses that you have to, and then you go further in things that you enjoy doing and things that you think will be most effective in helping you in your work. Um, my recommendation to students is that initially be as broad as you possibly can. Take courses in all different areas and you're required to as much as you can. And then as you start to get a further in school, start to narrow down what you're going, what you're studying, and uh, eventually, and when you get up, you might even specialize in one area, and that's what happened to me. There was no such area as auditory processing, but I had this broad knowledge. I narrowed it, and then I got into this, and I really concentrated on it. So. Um, because of the experience and knowledge, I was able to develop tests like phonemic synthesis and the SSW test. And both of them are widely used um, in many countries around the world. Um, uh, I also think it's important to pick a field that you enjoy and uh, if you enjoy it, then you can spend your life. And here I am next year at this time, I'll be 90 years old and uh, I still love doing the work. Uh, what are your suggestions for making a difference in the field of audiology? Um, it's, it's difficult for me to say what will make a difference, what you will make a difference because you're different than I am. Um, the one thing I can recommend is something that I live by, and that is put one foot in front of the other. Here you can see that I started with no chance, well, all my problems, and I wasn't looking, I wasn't looking at the future. A lot of people are thinking ahead. I am at this point and now I have to make a decision and I make a decision and I go to the next step. And uh, that might not be good for everybody. For me, it was the best thing because if I, if I had made any plans ahead, all of them changed. And so one foot in front of the other. 
um, I started to do a um, an autobiography uh, a number of years ago, and the title is uh, "One Foot in Front of the Other," and it's interesting that here you you saw all the different things that led to audiology. My history in the profession is not a simple one. I I was dissatisfied with certain places and experiences, and I went to something else. At others, they didn't like what I was doing or how I was doing it, and so I had to leave those jobs. The one thing that was consistent is that every time I made a change, it was better than the previous one. So just because you think that you failed, I didn't think I failed, but if you think you failed, that's not very helpful. This is an opportunity to do something further. Uh, the best thing that you can do is to devote yourself to your patients or students if you're a teacher and go wherever your brain takes you. Work hard to be effective and never give up. Could you share your three golden rules for life in general? I am so pleased to share it with you. Um, the first thing is my great grandmother, so she lived in the middle 1800s before either of you were born, right? Yeah, okay. And she was a volunteer social worker. And uh, at that time, there were no social workers. It was not a profession. But she would do so many things to help out people. And she was very wise. She said, you never know why people do the things they do. But if you did, you wouldn't be angry with them. To me, it's amazing that somebody in the middle 1800s had such insight into things following the Second World War. I, I've heard that from, from professionals, but from that was amazing. And uh, I, I think I live by that also. And that, um, that helps me to work with anybody, whoever it is. Um, I, I look at the good parts and I don't pay attention to the bad parts. I help the people or I work with people and um, uh, it helps me and it helps them. Um, very often when I have a student that's not very polite or something and I make a, a good influence on them, I see that it changes and that, and that patients follow. If you're kind to people, is it very likely that they will be kind back? Um, so that was the first thing. Sounds a little bit long, but next one is my mother was a very wise and caring person. She taught us that it is a sin to waste. It is a sin to waste. Now, I don't know if she thought of this years ago or if it was during the depression. We had a depression here in the United States. Uh, and um, um, I don't know when it came. Um, but uh, I follow this, uh, my mother's rule that uh, I don't waste paper and I save paper. I do things to save it. I don't waste electricity. I don't waste um, anything that I can possibly. And I try not to waste time. <clears throat> and this paid huge, huge dividends professionally. Um, when you give a word recognition test, are you familiar with word recognition, discrimination test? 
when when you give a a word recognition test and you add up the person's errors and you get a a number or a percent and uh, um is there something more that we can get for example you give a person a word recognition test and the person gets them gets a hundred percent correct but had long delays before each word so they hear the word say the word jump and the person is looking and jump now the person gets a hundred percent but is that telling you all that you need to know or and all that that test gave you no there's much more that you can get out of that um for example you can look at, at delays as and what they tell you about the person uh, when i first developed the ssw test it's a 10 minute test and it gives you uh, 20 different indicators of what the problem is, talking about different parts of the brain when, when you give that test. So um, uh, this started when the first study that we did on the SSW test, I had my students uh, test different groups of people. And one day, a student came in puzzled, didn't know what to do. She said, I don't know how to score this. The man got all four words correct upstairs downtown and got all four words correct, but they were not in the correct order. She said, how should I score it? I said, I, I don't know, but why don't you put number one, two, three, four under the words so we can think about that later on. So that was in 1962, I guess, 161. And, uh, and here we, we knew nothing about that. 15 years later, that was one of the four categories of the SSW, of the Buffalo model, the Buffalo model of auditory processing. And so there are three other categories and that organization is a category and it tells you about different things going on in the brain so um so what my mother said is it's a sin to waste and instead of just getting a percent or a number we get all of these different things that tell us about what's going on in the person's head I have one more, you, you mentioned what are the th important things um, in my life. And the, the third one, professionally, I had a, um, a professor <clears throat> who, <clears throat> who told us that <clears throat> something very, very important. <clears throat> if you have a patient and your patient has a problem, it's your job to figure out how to help the person. So, and when you work with patients, they have problems and uh, some of them we know what to do about, but some of them we don't. And whatever it is, it's your job to figure out how to do it. And <clears throat> this has solved so many problems for my patients because I didn't know what to do, but I figured out something that would be helpful to them. One time I was able, uh, I, I was trying to do something with some, some patients and I was trying to use what my professor had said, but I, I didn't have uh, enough knowledge to do it or equipment. And I did what I thought might be good. I was trying to figure out what to do. And uh, it turned out to be better than I could possibly have imagined. And I've been talking about the phonemic synthesis test. And the phonemic synthesis test, I just thought, 
maybe this would be a good thing to do. And then it turned out to be super, way beyond anything I could imagine. Um, so it's important if you are faced with a problem, see what you can do about figuring out how to solve it. Last question. Last question is, what are your expectations from young people in the field of audiology? <clears throat> um, one of the expectations is that to remember that audiology is a helping profession. Our job is to help people. And uh, it's important to earn a living, but if we're not helping patients, if you're working with patients and you're not helping them, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so not only can you help patients, but you can help your fellow students. You can help your profession and you can help other colleagues. If you know something that you found effective, share it with the other people. Very, very important. Um, whatever you decide to do, the important, it's very, very important, I think, to be a good example to other people. As a human being, if you are kind and hardworking and helpful um, and good intentions, you not only will help yourself in being effective, but it helps to change the people that you're working with. And I have a patient now who's not very pleasant and I show him how I am. I don't tell him this, but, and I, and gradually, gradually, he's starting to change. So be a good example to other people. And, um, and fortunately, they will be a good example to you. Um, I want to mention one last thing. I wanted to thank you guys so much and to the people who are listening and watching. Thank you for doing that. Um, I know my story was very long and complicated, but I if, hope you got some worthwhile information out of it. And I wish you the best of luck in what you do.